Welcome to Peninsula Seniors Lecture Series. Sit back, get comfortable, and let's go see what they have for us today. I'm Gene Hollander, Vice President of the Peninsula Seniors. And welcome to another educational lecture held weekly at Hess Park in Rancho Palos Verdes. If you're a car guy or a car guy, a gal, you're going to enjoy the presentation today because we have a, a, a review of the Hot Wheels that were a part of a buzzing background in our, in our country. And we're going to have Mr. Hot Wheels himself here to give this lecture. So please welcome Mr. Larry Wood. Well, welcome to uh, my presentation. This is a presentation I gave in Detroit to the automakers uh, a few years ago. And uh, so it's, it's a few years old, but, uh, and you know how technology changes. There's a few changes lately, but I'll talk about it at the end. Um, I gotta admit, this is the first time I've ever spoken to a, the group that bought Hot Wheels instead of the group that played with Hot Wheels. So you're the reason that Hot Wheels was so successful because the kids obviously weren't gonna buy the Hot Wheels when they first came out. And uh, they were so successful in the beginning that uh, they just kept going through all the years. And many, many toys only survive a year or two. In fact, when I got the job, I thought I'd do it for a year or so just to, for something to do as a job to pay the bills. And 44 years later, I'm still here doing this stuff. So it's, it's been fun. It's been a great job. Uh, the history of Mattel, most people know it. Uh, Handlers started the company in the 40s, I believe. And Ruth Handler came out with Barbie in the 50s. And we all know how Barbie did. She did fantastic. And then Mr. Handler saw his children playing with uh, some little toys that didn't do anything. They just little cars made by Matchbox. It didn't roll, didn't look good. They were all British cars and they weren't very colorful or anything. So he went back to his office and said to the design group, they said, well, let's see if what we can come up with. And he said, I want them to roll, I want them to look good, blah, blah, blah. And the first thing they did is they put some really trick wheels on them. And I guess the story is that somebody tapped the car and it rolled across the table and he says, now that's some hot wheels. And uh, the man knew his toys. He picked the perfect cars and he, he hired a designer out of Detroit uh, called Harry Bradley. He used to live right up here. And uh, Harry was a car nut like me and he liked hot rods and customs. So they were trying to figure out what to do. They were gonna do sports cars, they were gonna do British cars, they were gonna do r regular cars. But Harry Bradley drove a, a hot rod to work and the hot rod had a big engine and it was a bright color and it had an engine sticking through the hood and had red line tires and five spoke mag wheels on it and everything. And one day Mr. Handler walked by that car and he said, that's what I want on a Hot Wheel. So that's how Hot Wheels became the look, the California look. And of course, the stories I hear from the collectors all over the world are, yeah, when, when I saw that bright colored car with the big wheels on it and everything, I knew it was the, the kind of toy I wanted to play with. So let me give you a little presentation here. We'll go through it fairly quick. And if we have time, we'll ask, have some questions at the end. Okay, let's go get them. So, since 1968, and again, this is a few years old, uh, four billion cars. Every time you see a truck going down the road with a container on the back, it's either got Barbies or Hot Wheels in it. Okay, 1968. What could you get? I mean, you could get, it was a pretty good deal. We got some good stuff back then, but basically Hot Wheels were a dollar. And what did kids have to play with? No games, no cell phones. So what is he gonna do? This was one of the original ads from 1968.
That was actually uh, some tape with uh, the ad, original ads from 1968 with some of the later stuff and, of course, more modern music. So, in 68, Hot Wheels came out. Uh, it's funny because the stories I hear that the uh, buyers from the stores took a look at the little toy and thought, no, oh, it, it's not something we're going to handle. Well, within the first year, they ended up having to sell Hot Wheels out of trucks and parking lots. They were so popular. So that was the best-selling toy. And, uh, of course, I had to dress to, you know, 1968. I had my uh, hippie shirt and my uh, flower, so I was uh, just fitting like everybody else in 68. And, like I say, we started in 68, and we're now we're up to uh, f 5 million cars a week. This was a little later. This is about 72. This was the Hot Wheels design staff in 19, about 72. Um, last time I checked, there's 45 people there, so it's, gone, it's got a little larger. That's Bob Roses. He was the engineer at the time, and I was the designer at the time. We did every Hot Wheel for 15 years, there were two of us there. Before it got so large, they had to hire a bunch of other people to help us. This is the uh, start of a, well, this is the engineering drawings we had to do back then. Uh, no computers, nothing but a, a piece of paper and a straight edge and circle guides and everything. But this is how we started the Hot Wheels, how it became the pattern we had to make. And this is uh, the original sketch. Back then we called them B sheets. Uh, it was a size of paper that they used and so they started calling them at Mattel. I don't think anybody else did it. It was called a B sheet. This is uh, one of the guys I worked with back then, Paul Tam. This is a Gremlin and of course Gremlins were just economy cars back then but not Hot Wheels. We had to put four wheels and big engines in them. And of course everybody knows the Sh Carroll Shelby Cobra, 427 Cobra. This is one of the few cars that's still uh, in the line after all these years. Well, one of the most popular cars we ever did. And, of course, the fun part was doing cars that we didn't have to pay any royalty on. We just dreamed up cars and had a great time doing them. This is some exotic sports car I came up with, with, of course, the bigger engine in it, the faster it's going to go. That's what kids think, and so that's what I thought. And one of the most popular collector cars ever done was the Purple Passion, and it was a uh, 49 Mercury uh, customized. And the first one we did was purple, and the trouble is that every car, every color we ever did after that was still called the Purple Passion, but that's the way it's known, and, and we've b literally done hundreds of variations on this car, and the, it's a very well-collected car in the group of collectors. There I am talking to the boss. She uh, pays the bills, so you had to get the okay from her to do a car. And uh, Barbie said it was okay to do this one. And then after you uh, do the drawings and everything, the next thing is an exploded view. And this tells you how many parts you have to work with. And you have to cost every part, how it's made, how it's put together uh, on the assembly line. The more wheels cost money. Uh, when you're talking about a dollar car, every penny counts. And this happens to be the bus I did at the time. And it's got the, as you can see, it doesn't even have an interior in it because it didn't have any windows on it. And if you're doing a real car, you have to go out and find the car, take plenty of pictures, and measure it. And that's half the fun being a car guy. You got to go out and find yourself a Ferrari Testarossa, and uh, it's this is the way you get it accurate. Telec is a, uh, a Ferrari restoration shop, and he he was nice enough to let me uh, use one of his cars. He's down in Torrance, and um, fantastic shop. I mean, the cars in there are just beautiful cars. We've done a couple different cars. Most of the ca cars we do are for kids, the dollar cars. A little later on, I'll show you some of the collector stuff where you have to be 100% accurate. They cost a lot more money, and they don't sell as many, but that's the idea. They're collectors. And this is the model shop. What we do in the model shop, of course, is take that engineering drawing that you saw earlier, and now we have to make the parts. And to make the parts, we use, and this ha happens to be a supercharger we were looking at. We want to get it real accurate. So I actually found, found one. Actually, I took it off one of my cars and uh, gave it to the model shop, and they were carving it. That's the Don the Snake Perdome's race car pattern sitting there. And if you notice, it's awful big, because what we do is we do everything four times up. Now we're there, when you get down to the actual size, all the details in there. So you're, it's nice to work with the patterns, real big patterns. Now with computers, they can work on the computer any size you want. I mean, a wheel could be as big as the screen on the computer. But back then, we did the wood patterns like this. The next step after, well, this is another wood pattern. Uh, this is the Duesenberg that I did. Uh, again, four times up pattern, all the detail. You can see the louvers on the hood and everything. The uh, grill in the top and a few parts like that are missing, but they all fit on the top when it was done. Then you take that, 
and again, a, a 427 Cobra, and these were the guys that were genius. They could take a hunk of wood, and the black lines are glue where the pieces were glued together, and they would glue it together and start carving with a saw and some hand tools, and pretty soon they'd come up with these beautiful patterns. And of course, whatever you do on the pattern is going to be the toy, so that's the very important part right there. The next step after that, that is the shell, and the shell is the exact parts, four times up, but with the right thicknesses of everything. So the insides are the right thickness, all the seats. So this was the, Fer the Ferrari Testarossa that you saw me measure in earlier. And in this car, I did the seats that came through the back and became the taillights. The only trouble with that, you always had to have red seats in it because you wanted red taillights. And if you ever wanted to do a green interior, you all of a sudden had green taillights. But you know, it's one of those things that seemed like a good idea at the time. Another uh, shell, this shows the, the relationship of the uh, shell and the pattern to the actual toy. And again, you can see how much more detail you can get when they're that much larger. Now this is the critical part. You take the pattern, which is the wood part that is there, and this machine follows that piece every step, and then there's a cutter on the other end, which is four times down. And so every movement you make, the cutter goes one-fourth of the movement. And this is how you cut the tool. And uh, remember, I'm talking old school here. We don't do this anymore, but this is the way we did it back in the day. Uh, this would take a, quite a bit of time to sit there and follow the pattern, every part of it, and cut the tool. Now, we do it with computers. And this is, you can look at the car inside and out, upside down, all the different th directions. You don't have to do a drawing or, a or an engineering drawing or anything. You actually have all the stuff on the computer these days. Boy, does it save time. But I kind of like the pencil on the paper thing, so I, I still do that. And then the next step is we got to start thinking about it, what we're going to do to make them look good. And in this case, it's a paint job. In this, we were experimenting with uh, metal flake. And if you know metal flake, you put a little bit of gold in a, in, or silver in a paint, and when you spray it on, it glitters. And you can see the, the glitter and stuff there. Sometimes we got to remember we're making toys for kids instead of us adults. And we would try things like this to make them s jump off the shelf more. This is what we call Tampo, and Tampo is a machine they, they used over in Europe, and one of the engineers saw it and said, this is a great idea, because up to this point, we had always put decals on the car, or, or put a sheet in the car where the kid had to put the decal on the car. In this case, we do the artwork four times up. Every layer is a different piece of art, and in this case, there were, I think there were three different layers, the stripes, the name, and then the background. And then when we go over to uh, th where we make them, a machine takes them and pad prints, what they call pad prints, each color on the car. The car moves over and hits it with a different color, moves and hits it with a different color. And this is all the paperwork that goes with that to tell it what car it goes on and, and what the colors are and everything like that. We used to do that by hand. Now it's all done on the computer. This is what we call an e-sheet because it's an electronic uh, sheet. And it has the car in, this, in the right scale the designers actually design right on the car and then the computer figures out what, how it's going to fit on the car. It's got curves and everything. That in the old days was a real problem trying to figure out how the artwork stretched when it round, went around corners and everything. And now with the computer it basically takes care of all that. You can do just about anything. The stuff I've seen those guys do lately is just unbelievable. I always did stripes and flames because that's all I ever saw. Now they got clowns on them and, the, and all sorts of wild graphics and everything. And the kids love them. These are, this is why we can make five million a week because of all the different designs we can put out there. Now this was when we uh, sponsored a NASCAR car. Uh, Kyle Petty was our driver and we raced for years. We never won, but he was always the most popular driver. So in, in the long run, it was probably a better because you not, don't always win every NASCAR race. But with NASCAR, the Tampa was unbelievable. In this case, there were two, four, six, eight, ten passes. That car had to move ten different spots. So if, you could, if you're doing a whole line of NASCARs, you've got a whole huge building just doing these Tampo printings on these cars. And these machines are rotating around. And again, you've got to make a lot of cars. So these, this whole building is just filled with doing this kind of stuff. And later on, they came up with some uh, water slide decals that they could put on real easy over there, which didn't have to do all this, but they were much more expensive. We use those on the collector cars. But this is how we still make the decorations on the Hot Wheels today. And this is an example of how you, they, you hold the car in, it goes into the pad, and the pad comes down and presses one collar on it, 
goes over a little bit and presses down and puts the next color on it. Very labor intensive. But without all, I mean, we started it. We got ourselves in a hole because we had to do it. And now we're the, we are by far the best printers of any, hot, any types of cars out there. And this is a perfect example, and I was talking about the Purple Passion. This is the uh, Purple Passion, and again, you can see all the different decorations. And uh, some collector told me the other day there's over 200 variations on this car. And you've got to understand that there are some really die-hard collectors out there that will hunt high and low for this car in a certain color or a certain wheel. I meant to bring the books, but there's like all sorts of books. So there's one the other day I got that's two inches thick, and it's called Variations. And it has every car in there that we ever made, and whether or not the printing was a red color or a blue color, or the wheel was a red line or a black line. And if you're a diehard collector, you try to find every one of those. And I went through that book, and I, like after 10 pages, I, that's not what I do. I'm, I like one car, and that's the one. But these guys will, will spend hours. How will uh, conventions come up? There's one coming up in uh, Garden Grove in a couple months. And every room in the hotel is filled with Hot Wheels. Some guys even take their beds out and put shelves in there, and they have Hot Wheels in there. And they'll, all night long, they'll stay up and trade back and forth, and they'll wheel and deal and everything. And it's fantastic. And then they have uh, auctions where people donate certain cars, and they usually make about $10,000 for charity. And uh, I go, and all the other collectors, uh, designers go and sign autographs and everything. And it's pretty cool uh, knowing that something you worked on all those years, somebody actually cares. And of course, packaging. We have a whole packaging department. And what they do is obviously take the same car and have come up with a theme for it. Christmas time, Easter time, Father's Day, you know, things like that are going to make a big hit. And in this case, these are uh, some of the um, holiday cars I did. One year, I thought it'd be pretty cool to make a car just for the Hot Wheel people as a Christmas present. So we made a Hot Wheel car. We actually handmade it with decals and everything. And we handmade it's the uh, green package on the very left. We handmade the blister and we handmade the package. And I made, I think, eight of those because there were eight people working with us. Well, I think the last year I had to make 3,500 of them. So they, I had to make them through everybody that worked with Mattel on the, on the boys' toys. So it just shows you what happens. Would you like to make some comment about the worth or the value of those kinds of things these days? The, uh, in some cases, Hot Wheels are very valuable. Um, and this is very rare, um, getting a hold of some of the Christmas cars, mostly the early ones where I made 7, 10, 15, 25. And I, I don't know if I can put an actual value on it, but uh, let's put it this way. The, if you could buy a, uh, probably a nice uh, high-def TV with, for one of those. So, uh, you know, it's, it, there, there were some pretty good money. Um, again, it matters how few there were. The very first ones are, uh, you know, very expensive, and the later ones when they made 3,500, some people took them home and gave them to their kids, and they ripped them apart, and that, which is okay because it makes them rarer. You know that means there's less in the package. You want to try to keep them in the package, but some of the Hot Wheels are very, very rare, and people will pay just about anything for them. Scale. We do Hot Wheels in different scales, and in fact, this doesn't even have them all. But this is the 18th, the 43rd, and the 64th. The 64th is the dollar car, of course. The large one, the 18th scale, all of a sudden um, we have got into the high-end market where we sell cars for like $300. Um, that's become a real, you don't make many of course, you, you know, you try to keep the, the, the production down, but those things are so detailed. They, um, you open the hood and all the hoses are there and the wires are there and everything else. I have a couple models up here I can show you afterwards, but those things have just come on fantastic because of the detail that is in those. There's one car missing below that, and, it's, and we make one that's a little smaller. We just started making those, and those are very popular too. But you have to consider that when you're making these cars, you, you're going to make them in all these different scales. So. What's the cost then for one of those very few? Like, well, I'd say you can, I think these days uh, the cost on the, um, the high end, what we call the elite, are around uh, $200, I think, $125, $200. The resale. Um, and I've got a, a Batmobile here that I can sell for $500 just by 
telling somebody that I've got it for sale. It's the resale on the right cars will keep going. But again, if you ever see one of these in the store, you really should look at it. You, they're only in hobby stores, uh, high-end hobby stores and things like that, not in the Toys R Us or anything. And in our safety department, of course, we always have to uh, have a guinea pig that we use our safety stuff on to make sure everything works. In this case, it only went halfway in his head, so <laughs> it was safe enough. But, but we do get war stories about kids stepping on things, so you've got to be careful about the points, and you have to be careful about um, you know, if, if, if they'll go down, how fast, because some of these things go out of their tracks and their sets pretty fast, so you've got to be careful about, uh, sometimes I put rubber noses on them and things like that to make them a little safer. Also, Christmas time. All the grandparents got to get their kids something for Christmas time. So we like to take your money. In this case, it's a, probably a $50 set, which is taking that dollar car and going around a mountain or jumping jumps or going in water or something like that. The um, sets are our big profit margin, as you can imagine, because you, you, we sell quite a few of them. And, and again, parents like to get them something big for Christmas rather than just a Hot Wheel. Uh, this is just one of the sets that we came up with. There's a whole department now that just does sets. That's the actual set. And uh, believe me, I've put those together. and That's not fun. <laughs> that's a picture of the dinosaur set where the car went up onto the dinosaur. We had another one where the dinosaur actually bit the car as it came by and you had tried to go through the dinosaur's teeth. That's the actual toy. Um, Again, these are very popular, obvious at Christmas time and, and you know birthdays and things like that. So, if you need a present for your grandkid, get one of these. Keeps the profits rolling. And then uh, there's our department is uh, nice and neat. We keep everything clean so we don't get messed up and lose any parts. And uh, oops, we got a designer somewhere in there. We lost them last year. But the uh, design center is uh, is pretty creative. I'll tell you, there's a lot of people that would love to get in there and of course it's it's you can't do that but occasionally they let somebody in there you're blown away with the creativity that's around you all the time that was the fun part about working at Mattel you know coming up with my own stuff was fun but then you'd go into a meeting and some guy would come up with a a product that would just blow your mind where, where did he come up with that so we've ha I've seen f cars that floated in midair I've seen you know all sorts of crazy ideas and of course, a lot of practical jokes and stuff too. That's half the fun of working at a toy company. And uh, we didn't, I didn't do just Hot Wheels. Uh, Mattel would start another line. In this case, it was a uh, line of uh, monster trucks that were real monsters. And this was the truck that actually um, held the monster in it. When you pushed on the back, it would open up and become a monster itself. Plus, it would you would take the, the crane and drop the one of the monster trucks in the back, and the kid and it roared and made all sorts of noises, and, and it was great fun. And so we did a whole line like that. And again, you can imagine all the work that has to go into making the designing, the engineering, the wooden patterns, and everything. And these toys were a lot bigger. These toys were probably eight to ten inches long. Oh, this was a fun project. Um, we found out that there was a way to make paint change color and when it changed color that we could hide tampo underneath it and when it changed color you put it in hot or cold water and uh, these were great to take to a bar you could get a drink and say what color is this and tell the guy I'll bet you your drink and then you dip it in the drink and it would change color but what this is is there was a, was a sports car and then when you put it in the uh, you put it in the water it became a pizza that wasn't, we never actually made that one. I thought it was a good one, but you know, <laughs> a pepperoni pizza. So, Again, you've seen my drawings with a marker and a pen and, and pencil and stuff, but as years went along, uh, designers got high tech. I mean, they would use the computer to do fantastic things. This is Mark Jones, and this is one of the computer things that he would do. And boy, the, the stuff that was coming out of there in the last couple of years was mind-blowing. It was just fantastic, the things they could do on a computer. And sooner or later, you've got to make it into a toy. But just, I like artwork, and this is, his stuff was just fantastic. And then Greg Pageanton, same thing. He loved to work on a computer. And it was cool because we had computers that you could actually draw on the computer. When they first started, you had to draw on the, ta on the tablet down here, and it would come up here. Boy, that, you, my brain can't do that at all. So finally, they got the ones where you actually draw on the screen itself, and boy, that was pretty neat. I actually did one car on the computer. That was enough. I back to my pencil and paper. Another pageant. And the, the dream cars, dream motorcycles, you know, that's 
probably 60% of our line uh, because again, you don't have to pay licensing. Uh, that became, that was another thing with Mattel was um, when I first started there, you could do any car, any car, any graphic, anything you wanted. And um, one day I, I actually built cars for a, for a hobby, for a living. And I was helping a guy design a car and I did some design work for him and come to find out he told me it belonged to the, one of the ZZ Top band members. I thought, hey, that's kind of cool. So I went into work and I made the same car as a Hot Wheel with a Z's on the top and on the side and everything. And I thought that was great. Well, when it came out, they have a lawyer. And that lawyer called us up and said, you can't do that. And that was the very first time we actually got a hint that we better start thinking about what we're putting on cars, getting permission, blah, blah, blah. It ended up being a whole department. There must be 10, 15 people in that department. That's all they do all day long is if you want to put moon eyes on the side of a car, you have to get their permission. If you want to do a motorcycle from Kawasaki, you've got to get their permission. You want to do a Ford, you've got to get their permission. And you have to pay them, of course. Um, it became a big deal. And if you're doing like a NASCAR with all those decals on the side and everything or a race car, it begets, that department is busy all the time. So it's... A, it's too bad. You'd think everybody would want their name on the side of the car, but now nah, everybody wants money. Another, um, that act car actually was made into a full-size, a, a quarter-scale model when it's in the office. It really came out nice. It had a couple engines in it and big wheels and everything. It was really neat-looking car. This car we actually made into a real car. This is a 66 GTO, Pontiac GTO, and we decided that we were going to actually make some a real Hot Wheel car. So we went out and bought one stripped it down, painted it Hot Wheels candy red, uh, slight Hot Wheel logos on it and everything, put a late model Corvette engine in it and everything. Nice car, it's uh, on display right now in Indianapolis at the Children's Museum. I just flew back there to the opening of this museum. This museum is fabulous. If you're ever in Indianapolis, you should go to this museum. It is really something. And we were like on a second or third floor. We had five or six real cars in there. We have games for kids to play with Hot Wheels. We have videos running all the time. And so, like I said, I was back there for the grand opening and it just happened to be the Indy 500 weekend. So I got to go to the Indy 500. So that's a plus. Coming up with the name of a car. In the beginning, the cars were named by a, a guy who, uh, <laughs> that was his job and he would name the cars, but he wasn't really a car nut. So we got some kind of strange names in the beginning. Lately, they're letting us uh, name our own cars, so that's kind of fun. It's trying to come up with a name for your car. And again, you have the legal department. Sometimes the name is taken by somebody as a race car or something like that. So you got to go through that every time, too. This is a uh, one of the dream cars. We actually, uh, I'm not sure if this is the one, but we actually asked Ford, Chrysler, and General Motors to design Hot Wheels. And it was pretty cool because they came up with some wild concepts. It's funny, though, because their cars always, you can fit a person in it. It just shows you what they're, you know, they're so used to doing a car that you can fit a person. And when you got a Hot Wheel, you can put the cockpit in the front. The guy doesn't have to have legs. So they, they, they would, they, it was funny because they didn't go far enough out for us, we, you know, but they did some great stuff. This might have been one of them. Race cars, you can't beat race cars. Kids love race cars. And, uh, you know, put a number on the side and, and a wild looking car with a big engine and big exhaust, it's bound to be a hit. And of course, uh, with the new um, kids out there now, the little Japanese rice rockets have been real popular. And we've done lines of, of those new cars. And, you know, again, you can imagine a kid, is that's what he sees these days. He doesn't see a hot rod going down a street or a race car or anything. He sees a Honda or something like that going down the street. So these have been all of a sudden have taken off like crazy. We, we do a whole line of these. And again, computer drawings. Sooner or later, you got to get down to do an actual drawing of this thing. So there's sometimes where you do these these things and everybody likes it, and then you, all of a sudden you're down to making it for a dollar, and it, it doesn't quite work. But that's part of the fun. This was the design challenge of, that I was telling you about that uh, General Motors and, and uh, Chrysler went on. And this is a General Motors wild Corvette that somebody came up with. Uh, this was Chrysler. They had some kind of atomic motor in it where they had the engine hanging off the side, a cooler or something. And this was Ford. It was a, the, a kind of a takeoff on the 4951 Ford and uh, the modern version of it. They did some great jobs, and these were real popular for a while. This was Honda. Honda had a, if you 
looked this car on end, it was a Honda H with the drivers on one side and the passenger on the other and the engine in the back. Beautiful model. They actually built, uh, I guess they were quarter scale models. They were about this big. We put them on tour. They were at the Peterson Museum and then they went around the United States. And that was really cool stuff. I think this was Mitsubishi and they did uh, you know, a takeoff on one of their cars. And this was Lotus. Lotus, a nice light little sports car. And of course it came out looking like one of their cars. I think this is the Mitsubishi front engine, uh, front wheel drive car. Now, I don't know how many of you remember the Snake and Mongoose race cars back in the um, 70s, but we sponsored uh, a series of race cars, uh, what they were called the Snake and Mongoose. And it was a two person team that went out and raced against each other all across the United States. And we built Hot Wheels of them, and we built the Hot Wheels set of, of the race thing too. Real popular. We were one of the first major sponsors on race cars, and this was it. And um, it was perfect timing. And the kids went nuts. And these guys that went on the tour, they went out there and signed autographs when they were racing and everything. And just the other day, I got a call about some guy playing me in the movie, the hot Snake and Mongoose movie. And so the guy called me up and asked me a couple questions, and I did a couple drawings for him. So when the camera comes over his shoulder, he's got one of my drawings there of how they came up with the cars and so it's going to be interesting if it's a I think it's a medium budget movie it should be pretty good and, and if you're a car nut of course we'll go see it and again this is another one of the real cars that we built this is a model T T bucket that we uh, bought and put the Hot Wheel logo on it and uh, it's been in around all the shows and everything else now this is our pride and joy um, Back in the uh, first couple of years, we did a Hot Wheel of a twin engine car like this, and we called it the Twin Mill. And it was real popular, and it was kind of the icon of the, of the Hot Wheel series at the time. And then years later, when we decided to build real cars, we said, what car would we build? And we said, well, we got to build the Twin Mill. Yeah, the most, <laughs> you're going to build a car with two Corvette motors in it with superchargers on it, and it puts out 1,400 horsepower and drives on the street. Well, we did it. and. Uh, I'll tell you what, that thing's fun to drive. Uh, you can't see anything, the engines are too big, but uh, that's okay, you don't, you know, you figure you're going a quarter mile at a time. What's the worth of that? That car, we, we have got a lot of money and time and effort into it, and I don't think it'll ever be for sale, so it'll be one of those things that there would be no price to be able to put on it. Some collector would probably pay a lot of money for it, but I'm sure Mattel will never sell it. Yeah, you can offer me, I'll go steal it. <laughs> I'll sell it to you. <laughs> but it's been, it's been, and it's also been painted uh, many different colors. Right now it's a candy blue, it was candy red. It looked, this is probably the best color it ever was. But, uh, and it, we painted it the colors that the toy was through the years. And um, that thing is a, when that thing fires up, you know it. And here's that GTO I was telling you about that came out real nice. and. And it goes too. I, we had a chance to drive it back east once at a racetrack, and it goes pretty good. And my office, of course, wasn't a mess. It was always nice and clean, and I didn't have any toys on my office, so we, you know, I kept kept busy and and uh, had a. I, I tried to keep the toys off to the side while I did my drawings. But if you you know you got toys around you all day long, you get to play with them. And there's no reason working if you don't have a reason to spend your money. I mean, your wife can't spend it all. So I uh, bought a shop down in Long Beach, and I've built cars for the last few years just for, just for something to do, you know. So I've got a bunch of different cars, and I've got some pictures up here. This is a 38 Ford truck that uh, I bought, and I ended up only using the very front of it after I bought, uh, you know, I threw the rest of it away and built everything else on it. But it, uh, it's, done, it's been done for the last couple of years, and then I got this bright idea of building an antique trailer. And so I bought a 1951 Spartan trailer, 35 feet long. What a jewel, what a nice piece. The only trouble is it was junk. I've spent five years restoring the inside of it. It's all birch inside, and, and it, I tried to restore it with red linoleum and everything, and it looks like a 50s diner now with red and white seats in it and everything. But I've piped stereo system through it, and I've got uh, TVs everywhere and everything, and it's really neat. It's one of those things that uh, you always wanted to do. And I want to go camping with it, but of course at $4 a gallon, I'm not going to get very far. It's be, it, you can fly and get a nice hotel for what it'll cost me in gas. But you'll, you'll see me around at some of the car shows with it. And again, this is my shop. I decided if I was going to have a shop, I wanted it to look like a 50s gas station. So I've got gas pumps. And part of my shop is Hot Wheels stuff. And part of it is um, 
artwork, and the other part is actually working, where I can actually do my stuff. This is the artwork, and this is my Nash, and some of you may have seen it out in the parking lot here. But I got a hoist, so I can go underneath without bending. I don't bend that good anymore, so I had to get a hoist. And you can see another gas pump on the left. That's a 1914 gas pump that was built in uh, Long Beach called a Joy Gas Pump. That's it coming along. It, it got better as the time went along, but that's as I was working on it. And at work, we, they saw my shop and they said, why don't we build a gas station? I thought, that's kind of cool. So, so they went out and they built this uh, really neat gas station with neon Hot Wheel signs and, and gas pumps and everything else. And we'd bring a car in once in a while and just put it in the gas station. We all worked in a gas station, I thought, which is what I wanted to do when I was 16 years old. So it worked out great. And then when your boss builds a custom motorcycle, that's even better. So John Handy built a um, motorcycle with an old Ford flathead in a 1938 Ford engine in it. And uh, that, was, you know, that shows you what kind of bosses you have there. They weren't all bosses like John Handy, but he was one of the best. And I do a little freelance work. As long as it's not a toy, I, I, do, I do some work. And I don't know if you've ever seen Robosaurus, but Robosaurus eats cars. He goes on the tour of the monster truck series, and during the break, he comes out, reaches down, grabs a car, his jaws are more, so powerful it cuts it in half, and then he throws fire and burns it and everything. Keeps the kids entertained. But that's got to be one of the strangest jobs I ever did. That thing was huge. And the neat thing about it is we made it so it folded up, and his hands came down and grabbed the back of the truck that towed it. So he would just lean down, grab the truck, and they would drive away with him. And then, um, in my 35th year, I was lucky enough they came up with this idea of me going on tour. Okay, I figured they're going to give me a pickup truck and send me on the road. Well, they got me a motorhome and told me to take off across the United States. And so I, I, I did, had a great time. We, that motorhome was so full of Hot Wheels. And there was always a crowd every time I stopped somewhere. Of course, you give away Hot Wheels. You're gonna, if I didn't have any Hot Wheels, there wouldn't have been anybody there. But uh, we would stop at, gas, at uh, car meets and, and do everything else and hand out Hot Wheels. And it, it ran a lot better on the way home when it was out of Hot Wheels, I'll tell you that. It was a lot of weight in it. And then uh, on the, uh, the anniversary, 40 years, we did a cross-country tour. And that's basically w w the time I, sh I made this presentation. So we, we went on the, across the United States. And what we did is we stopped in, in car places across the United States. Let me tell you, they were looking for car places to stop when going across the United States. They came up with a place called Speed, Kansas. Well, Speed, Kansas has three houses in it. And we thought, what the heck are we going to do? So we, we said, we're going we're gonna to show up. We're going to tell everybody we're showing up at Speed, Kansas. They actually took some couple farmers' fields and had them plowed because the fields were full of hay and stuff. And we just bought them and had them plowed. Uh, 15,000 people showed up in Speed, Kansas. It was fantastic. The mayor, mayor, he never saw anything like it in his life, of course. And we took over your hotel for 15, 20 miles away. And it was, it was fantastic. And then we stopped at Indianapolis, of course. And then we went to Watkins Glen and went to uh, other places, car places all across the United States. So it was a fun tour. We had a good, good time going cross country. Now, if you're interested in seeing anything, this is basically for collectors. Uh, the Hot Wheels Collector.com is the site. There's also a site for kids, uh, just Hot Wheels. Um, and so we do everything, you know, online. But we sell cars online for collectors. And, of course, you know, that way they're, they're, they're nice cars. They're collector cars. You don't have to put them in the store. They're just put on the shelf, and they're decorated special. They cost about $15, and they're really written nice. And so we've been doing that for the last 15 years, and it's been very successful. And, of course, the whole reason we do Hot Wheels is the kids are playing with Hot Wheels. That's my son. He's now 43, but uh, he would go out in the driveway and play with his Hot Wheels all the time. And, and we had to always remember that was the reason we were making Hot Wheels, to keep the kids happy. So that's it. I thank you very much. OK, we'll take a few questions here. And the question was, uh, are where are Hot Wheels made, basically? Um, Hot Wheels were actually made when I first started at, in the Hawthorne plant. The first, while I was there, when I first got hired in 69, I could go to the back plant and get, um, get a Hot Wheel right off the assembly line. And by the way, those are the real rare ones because they were not all you know, put out on the shelves. Uh, but as you can imagine, as time went along, 
Oh, a perfect example is like in the very first slide, uh, the cost of a home was forty thousand dollars, cost of gas was a dollar fifty, cost of a hot wheel was a dollar. Cost of a hot wheel a day is a dollar. That's the only reason we do it. If you make three five million a week, you gotta have, be able to make them pretty cheap. And in the long run, it, it has worked out. But we have moved uh, from China, Japan, Malaysia, all over China, you know, everywhere we go. And actually, they actually are so good over there at making this stuff. It's unbelievable. And they don't just make ours. We have our own plants, of course. But in some of the collector things where we have to get them really accurate and stuff, we go to the places that actually make competitors, too. And so you can, you can, you can go over there and see your competitor stuff come right off the same assembly line. But it's strictly cost. Where uh, did all the original artwork and patterns and everything go? Uh, very good question, because basically Mattel didn't care. Um, you could walk out with anything back in the day. And to tell you the truth, I didn't think about collecting or keeping this stuff until about mid-70s when one of the guys next to me came over and borrowed something of mine and says, can I keep it? And I'm going to, you know, I'm going to hold on to it. And I thought, oh, I had to hold on to my stuff. And so through the years, it has um, disappeared. Um, but I got to tell you, it's reappearing more and more. Uh, you go to a Hot Wheel convention and you'll walk into a guy's room and there's my drawing or my pattern or something. And they're worth some good money. Some of that stuff is really worth some money. Mattel was not very good at the time of keeping things. Now, of course, with digital and everything else, they can keep things pretty good. I think it's actually better because now, if I wanted to find a drawing or a pattern or something, I could find it. If Mattel had it, I'm guaranteeing we could never find it. It would be in the warehouse somewhere and nobody, through the years of the person being in charge of it, it would have disappeared in or put in a box or something. So in my opinion, it's actually better that the collectors have this stuff because they do show it off. And, and, and of course, if Mattel needs anything, I, I'd be glad to take it in and give it to them to let them use it for displays and stuff. So it's, it's good that it's out there. The, um, how did Hot Wheels sell through the years? Well, Hot Wheels was so hot in the very few first few years that anything, it couldn't have kept it up. It was just unbelievably you know, hot. And most toys only last a couple of years, so they actually thought after a couple of years it would start dying off, which it did. And uh, probably in the 70s, it got so bad that they actually started to try to make them cheaper. And in, in the 70s Hot Wheels, they took the red line off the tire and they took all the decoration off the car. Those are the most valuable Hot Wheels. If you can find those Hot Wheels, because they, again, like you said, there were very few made at those years. That is the, the very collectible series of cars. Those cars are worth three to $500 a piece if you can find them. And um, it's like everything else, the rarer they are. And then it just started to come back. And I'll tell you that the breaking point was when the parents started to buy toys for their kids. The parents that played with Hot Wheels, when their kids got born, they would go to the store and they'd look over and say, hey, I played with this great toy. That's when everything took off. Of course, the parents would buy one for themselves and one for the kid. And uh, I mean, that's, it's gotta, at that time, we had to hire people. We had to go, go to different factories. Everything just took off at about 20 years into it. Yeah, to tell you the truth, Tootsie Toys, uh, or what other cars were available before Hot Wheels? Yeah, Tootsie Toys, I think, was British also. I think so. Um, no? U.S. Was it U.S.? To okay. Um, I don't remember seeing, I, I can see them at swap meets and stuff like that. But, okay. But again, you, they didn't roll very good. They didn't look. They weren't bright colors or anything. So um, that's the kind of toy that... When Mattel had its first look, it was available out there. They put those on the shelves and said, we got to do something different than that. So um, that was the cars that we were trying to beat at the time. When I was a youth 40 years ago, <clears throat> one of my favorite, what are you laughing <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> one of my favorite toys was the Erector set. Oh, yeah. And uh, working at uh, Belford Grumman, yeah. I went back to Island it's a different time. Um, what toys did I play with when I was growing up? Uh, Lincoln Logs and Erector Set. Uh, you could, it was fantastic. You had nice nuts and bolts and pieces that would all go together and you could make something out of them. I've always wanted to work with my hands. Um, 
when I was in uh, high school, I was drawing cars, of course, and doing everything, and my English teacher told me I'd never get anywhere drawing cars. And uh, <laughs> she, was, she was right. Uh, but the, the, in fact, I had an interview once on a, a TV show, and the, it was for math, and, and we were talking about Hot Wheels and how math is, you can do it you know, four times up and measure things and blah, blah, blah. I said, you know the best thing about math class? And she got all excited and the camera was running and everything. And I said, the paper had no lines on it. I could draw cars. <laughs> so that was the best part of math, as I remember. So, uh, and I just barely made it out of high school. And then when I got out of high school, I didn't know what I was going to do. And I went off and I worked for Pratt & Whitney Aircraft for a while and I did sheet metal work and I did a few other things. And again, I started to use my hands and build cars and having a good time. And, and one day I turned around, the guy next to me was old, he was 35 or so, and I, he was doing the same job. And I thought, I don't want to do this job for the next 30 years. So I came to Los Angeles and went to Art Center. And at Art Center, if you graduate, you were basically um, going to get a job. And we started with 50 uh, kids in my class, and six of us graduated, and we all went to Detroit. And one, of them, in fact, my roommate became head of Ford uh, truck styling and he also went to England and to Australia and ran the fact the design group over there and we've always kept in touch you know what it's like high school but uh, college buddies are always your best friends so we keep in touch oh in in most cases uh, oh who, who else builds uh, die cast cars there are quite a few different car, die cast car companies out there the problem is they can't make the volume we make for the price. So they don't go after us at that end. They go after us at the collector end. They do um, a little more expensive toys. Some of their toys have um, pullbacks in them. Um, Tomy from Japan is one. There's, there's about five different die cast companies out there. But most of those will do the high end 50 to $200 car because that's a good market for them. They can they can do it and make money at it compared to trying to make a dollar car, which uh, nobody can do. Uh, Hot Wheels wheels. The whole thing that became a Hot Wheel was the Hot Wheels. And what they did is the engineers came up with these real thin axles, and they put a, in the beginning they put a little Delrin bearing, which is a real slippery plastic, and then they snapped the wheel on top. And if you notice the wheels, they're tapered a little bit, so only a little bit of the wheel touches. So a combination of all those things, and of course getting the wheels straight and everything like that, made Hot Wheels so fast. And that's what made them, you know, the best and the fastest at the time. And that is really what what did it. Um, I suppose nobody asked what the most valuable Hot Wheel is, so I'll give you a hint. A guy had a Hot Wheel and he had it for sale, and a guy I know from a collector, a serious collector, asked him what he wanted for it, and he said, I want to buy a new Viper. Well, a new Viper was $72,000. The guy bought the car, and the guy got the Viper. <laughs> so those Hot Wheels, and this is one of the Hot Wheels that, remember I told you I could go to the factory and pick up a car off the line? That's what happened. What happened is they built a Volkswagen bus that was too thin to go through what we call the superchargers. It has two little wheels that spin, and the car was too thin to go through there. So they only built, uh, I think the rumors are there's only 24 or 50 of them, something like that. And when they came off the assembly line, they said they don't work. Throw them away. Well, some people put them in their office. Some people played with them. Some people took them home. And... Um, one, uh, pink cars are the most popular because we didn't do a lot of pink cars. They were just a, kind of an experiment to see if girls would play with Hot Wheels. So pink cars are most expensive. Well, somebody found a pink Volkswagen bus. And like I say, somebody paid $72,000. It has been for sale for 100000 Nobody's bought it. But if you want to buy a Volkswagen bus for 100000 uh, I know where you can get one. Uh, re <laughs> recently, a second one was found, and another collector bought it. Don't know what he paid for it, but it was probably pretty good money. But those Volkswagen buses that aren't pink, they go for about 35000 And there's 20 of those out there that I, they know of. Uh, and I, I know where there's a couple more that people don't know about. So. We have a car show produced by the Kingers here. And I've never seen that national so you're not a local Oh, no, I've been there. Yeah, yeah you've oh, been yeah. there. That's how we found yeah. it. Yeah, in fact, see, the trick is I have so many cars, I drive a different car every time. 
<laughs> would you like to expand on the ZZ Top story of which particular vehicle and so on? Uh, and the, the ZZ Top car was uh, built by a friend of mine called Don Thielen, and it was one of the oh, high quality. Oh, okay. The ZZ Top car that uh, we, we got in trouble uh, with at Mattel on the legal end of it was a uh, 34 Ford, and it was built by a buddy of mine. It was the real car it was built by a buddy of mine, and he wanted a couple idea sketches, so I did some of the idea sketches, and it was the car in the uh, video where the girls come out with the key, with the ZZ Top key, and they transform this everyday guy into this cool guy that gets in this uh, car, and it had two Zs down the side. And when I did the Hot Wheel, I did the two Zs down the side on this red 34 Ford, and I got in trouble for that one. The Eliminator. The Eliminator. The Eliminator Coupe, it was called. What was the reason you got in trouble? Illegal reasons. Uh, we didn't get permission from ZZ Top to, oh. to, to do it. it, it you know, ZZ Top wanted um, money, and uh, same with everybody else now. Uh, you know, it's the, the licensing is a big, big deal. In some cases, people get paid to put uh, get paid to put sponsors on the side. In perfect example, a skateboarder that is famous, he'll be doing his skateboard thing, and everybody will look at his board and say, "Oh, he's got so and so's name on the side of the board." In Mattel's case, we're making money off it, not the other way around. So, uh, it, you know, it's the way it goes, and uh, it, it's fine. It's still hard to believe we can make a car for a dollar after paying all those people off. <laughs> My, my favorite story, which probably won't go on TV, is um, they had, a, a, my favorite story from Mattel back in the day was there was all sorts of, of ideas being kicked around. And one day, a guy had a propeller on a wire hanging from the ceiling with a bag underneath it with yellow fluid in this bag. And this propeller just, and two wires going into the bag. And the propeller just kept going and going and going and going. And the rumor was that this was a urine-powered engine. And of course, we thought, the big shots thought, boy, we're gonna make a fortune here, you know, forget gas, we can just, you know, everything will be great, you know? Well, when it came time to do the investigation, he had reworked the air conditioning duct with a little hose pointed at that propeller. So the air conditioning was blowing at the propeller and it was spinning by itself. <laughs> <laughs> but also, uh, I, 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 Mattel at the time, the, the, the object of working there was to get a window office. And of course, after a few years, I finally got my window office. And the, the, we, had, we, we had a whole row of offices there but, and walls between them. But between, there was a shelf because of the window. There was a shelf there. Well, we put a Hot Wheel track there between all our offices. And during the day, you would you know, throw a Hot Wheel car down and it would go at one end and somebody else would throw a Hot Wheel car. And then we made a little train. It was self-powered, battery-powered train. We'd put the little train on there and send it down and one day it would come back with, you know, a note on it or something or a Barbie doll stuck to it or something. And it got escalated and of course things got a little crazy there. And one day I'm sitting in my office looking and I look over and the train's on fire. <laughs> <laughs> They had poured uh, uh, glue on it and lit the glue on fire and uh, stopped right in the window of my office with this fire. Luckily, I had a water bucket there and I put it out. But you know, it was a, it was a fun time. It was it was very small. Again, there were only uh, Bob Roses and myself, you know, in the department. So you can imagine what it was like, you know, around there. And and Barbie department. I mean, we didn't even pay Barbie's taxes. You know, I mean, Barbie was the queen. So there was all sorts of things we crazy things we did back then. So it, it was fun. Yes, uh, Eldon Toy Company was one of our competitors. I can't remember what their what their toys were at the time, but yeah, they were a competitor of ours. Yeah, anyway, <laughs> uh, as the to as the, the company became bigger, and profits were the word rather than a fun toy company, um, you can imagine things tightened down, and you sat most of the time in meetings and discussing things and everything. There was still plenty of uh, fun people and things to do but it was never never like uh, like it was in the beginning and it couldn't be it, it's you know it's a big company now uh, I mean, in fact it's one of the few companies the stock is still going up great so yeah. who's are the major competitor for Hot Wheels today again there's nobody really out there that's 
coming up with the, the um, everyday in your supermarket toy. They try. There's some toys out there, some companies, non-brand, mostly uh, Chinese companies that bring cars in. What about Matt, Matchbox? Uh, Matchbox Toys is actually owned by Mattel. And when I first started there, Matchbox was the competitors. And on my goals, you always had to have paperwork that says what your goal was. My goal was always to beat Matchbox. Well, when we bought them, that was the end of that goal. <laughs> so I had to come up with another goal. That was an easy one for a while. But uh, yeah, so Mattel bought them. And what Matchbox does is Matchbox does fire engines, SUVs, everyday cars. They don't do the creative, wild, crazy stuff that Hot Wheels does. So they, they've actually divided the two, two markets. Back in the day, I did fire trucks. And, and a, another funny story is that I did a tow truck once, and um, I thought it'd be fun to have my phone number on the side. I figured if you know, you go to a car meet or something, you'd hand the toy out. It'd be like a business card, you know. I just forgot that we're making $5 million a week. Um, <laughs> the phone started ringing New Year, uh, Christmas Eve from some, some kid, and it didn't have an area code at the time. And uh, some kid said, is this Larry's towing? And I thought, uh-oh. I said, yeah, is your mom and dad up yet? No. <laughs> well, why don't you go put that back under the tree? <laughs> and um, the problem was I didn't have an area code on it. So all over the United States, my phone number and different area codes were getting phone calls. We finally got a call from a church saying, would you guys cut it out? Uh, you know, we got every kid in the whole area calling us about Larry's towing service. So uh, it's one of, the, one of the fun projects that I got. I think that's a good point. Uh, five million five. phone numbers. Yes, there were, yes, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Well, thank you, very thank much. you everybody. Thank you for watching Peninsula Senior Lecture Series. I'm Betty Wheaton. See you next time.